All right, we are live, guys. Um, I'm going to do a quick introduction here. Um, thank you to everyone joining us today. Uh, this is week three of the Virtual Throws Conference. Um, we're going to throw a big thank you out there to uh, MF Athletic uh, and the National Throws Coach Association, who have just been instrumental in, in getting us some great presenters and, and helping us, you know, share some information with with everybody around uh, around the country and around the world. Um, and today we have you know, Tom Puxtis, who is joining us, who is going to be an awesome presenter, talking about his experiences as a as an elite athlete, as a coach, and um, as a you know the leader of USA Javelin Project. Um, Tom is an Olympic javelin thrower, a former world record or American record holder. Sorry, yeah, and, not um, world. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, we're we're excited to have him on. So without you know further ado, we'll kind of get into some of these questions and um, you know start start hearing from Tom. So Tom, I guess the first question is is love to hear a little bit about your background. Um, I know you have Lithu Lithuanian heritage, and we'd love to hear a little bit about that and and just how you grew up and and how you kind of. Uh, you know, what your sports history is and all that? Well, I, yeah, I grew up outside of Chicago and always seemed to take a liking to throwing things. I do remember as a really young guy being near a golf course and seeing someone hit a golf ball, and I was mystified as to how far it would go. It was always kind of interesting to me. And uh, I also spent some time on the beaches of Lake Michigan, which just so happened to have great throwing stones, and I would just spend my uh, time at the beach throwing rocks. So as a young guy, I developed an arm. And uh, one thing led to another as as I got older. And my brother, who was eight years my elder, uh, graduated high school in 1978 and had an opportunity to go to Lithuania to go to medical school. And my brother threw the shot put and discus in high school. Pretty okay, like 56 in a shot and 172 in a disc. And uh, of course, he was focused mostly on medical school, but he did train. And he, they roomed him with a javelin thrower. And this javelin thrower is like family to me now. He's actually threw about 70 meters when he was 17 years old. So a very good javelin thrower. And um, they talk, talked about families. And uh, he, he's, he, my brother would tell uh, his roommate about me and said, oh, you should bring him a javelin and let him try throwing. So he did. He brought home some Russian javelins called Kalitvas from the... Oh, man, 1979, they were these aluminum things and uh, very flexible. They kind of had old rules, of course, old rules design. And I, he brought three of them home. I think he bought them at the local sports shop for like uh, a few rubles, which would be the equivalent of at that time, a couple of dollars, you know, like some, some ridiculous low, low number. And uh, I started throwing at the park locally as a 12 year old. I learned a little bit about having a long arm and I just kind of had fun with it. And then it took off from there. Nice. And you know, what other sports did you play growing up and, and through high school and what's kind of your, your athletic background outside of throwing the jazz? So I played baseball. Yeah. I played baseball, a little bit of football, football didn't work out. Having parents from Lithuania, uh, not having someone that had played football, I wasn't ready for the, you know, lambasting you get on a daily basis. And I didn't get it. Like they're yelling at you and swearing and no one's teaching me anything. You know, it's like, okay, coach, exactly. I just didn't get it. It wasn't for me. Where baseball, I had the most wonderful people coach me. And I have nothing but like stellar memories, laughing, excellence. We were really good. Everybody loved it. So I love baseball growing up, no question. And a little bit of basketball, like to try everything, rode BMX bikes and all that kind of stuff. A little bit of motorcycles here and there when I could afford it, but uh, family was very modest. And then uh, track and field came calling once my brother uh, graduated from school and came back to the States. And I switched from baseball to uh, shot and disc. And that was that. So junior and senior year, I threw shot, disc and javelin. Nice. And here's the, uh, the trivia question. Um, from Rob is, is what do you and Amos Alonzo Stag have in common? And oh my gosh. Well, I'm a graduate of that school. Um, I don't know. Did, was he a javelin thrower? He was the, he's the winningest D three coach of all time. I don't know what I have in common with him. You going to bail him out, Rob? Uh, Amos Alonzo Stag was known for uh, 
obviously his other sports, but he he was a 1924 head Olympic U.S. track and field coach. No way. So, I no so idea. both of you were were uh, on track and field steps. <sighs> they, and you went to high school at Amos Alonzo Stag High School. Yeah, I mean, I did read about him, and I heard that he was pretty a great guy when he yeah. was a young. You know, he was actually a great guy. So I was, you know, normal. Oh, I didn't know that. That's amazing. I wish I knew that. You, you lost a hundred bucks. Taking care of me so many years, I, I owe you probably a couple thousand at this point. And. Um, can you tell us a little bit about your collegiate experience at Florida and, and you know your relationship with your college coach uh, John Kennison? Yep, great guy. Uh, so you know I was very uh, motivated individually, and I didn't need anybody to tell me what to do or how to do it. I just needed some help, and you know I was a pretty pretty maniacal when it came to energy and desire. Um, I wanted to be good, very 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 badly, and. Um, he influenced me, I'll tell you, be honest with you, he had the best influence on me to become a pro athlete. And here's where it worked out. So my first year there, there were other throwers. I would throw. I would do pretty well. Uh, I just so happened to get a really bad food poisoning in the middle of my junior season at Florida. I, I went to Tallahassee and had some oysters and spent two nights in a hospital and lost like 13 pounds, literally a month before the conference. Uh, I ended up finishing okay at nationals but i was down so senior year i remember training and i asked coach to give me a workout and you know he probably was busy with for a day or two and you know me i'm like the stubborn jerk that i am and um somehow i got like mad and stormed off and so we had this really interesting meeting very emotional meeting in his office and um uh, the head coach at that time, I thought either he's going to make or break this situation. And uh, his name is John Webb. And um, he ended up putting us together. And it was awesome from that point on. And all it was, was I remember Kennison saying something like, well, you know, I got these other guys, you are so okay without my help. And then these other guys come out and they need my help. And I'm like, yeah, but I'm here for you. I, I want you there. I need you too. And he just didn't quite you know, sense that he wanted to help the guys who needed more help than me, basically. And I'm like, well, I need you too. So he set aside like 90 minutes for me. And um, the main thing that he helped me was progression. So I used to throw hard all the time and hurt myself and, you know, do silly things. And he basically stopped me from throwing hard and said, you're going to, I'm going to limit you to like 200 feet. And then we he brought the cone out. You know, we used the cone. It's don't throw past the cone. And it was like 210, then 220. And at each level, I had to maximize my efficiency. Hmm. So it doesn't matter. He only limited my uh, run up. And um, that was incredibly critical. So I learned how to throw without using my arm. So basically, I would throw like 220. I could, you know, smoke it with my hand and buckle my knee and do all kinds of silly things and get it out there. And um, with his help, he forced me to learn how to use my body to throw a certain distance. And well, you know, lo and behold, I threw 83 meters 30 as a 21 year old kid in college. And if I didn't hurt the elbow at the net, at the conference meet, I just dropped my arm trying hard and hurt my elbow. I, I have a feeling that I was very confident that 85 meters or more were possible that year. Wow. Um, that's very cool. And, and rumor has it, you know, going through some some background that you have uh, tried out for an MLB team is that is that any any truth to that rumor yes there is I spent uh, 11 days with the Yankees in the fall of 96 so my pitching was okay hit 92 miles an hour but um, uh, I'll tell you what the real historical event of that time was it had nothing to do with my pitching or baseball it had everything to do with uh, an issue I had with chicken with fried chicken. Rob, you don't know this story? Oh, I sorry. Oh, I, this, boy. Yeah, I, I pulled the classic. I muted him because yeah. I'm unmuting him. Well, now. this is this is personal, but I don't mind talking about it because I'm a little <laughs> crazy like that. So uh, I'll try to make it brief. So my time at, with the Yankees was incredible. The guys are great. They were helping me out. I did okay. Pitched okay. I had a couple of inter-squad games against paid professionals and actually held my own. But the last night I was there, I was out on a 
on a date with a girl that I met at the Olympics. And um, earlier that day for lunch, we had some fried chicken. And somehow I must have swallowed a bone fragment, unbeknownst to me. Uh, so what had happened was I'm out to dinner in the evening, and uh, all of a sudden I felt like, well, someone was trying to, you know, uh, something was trying to escape my body through my rear end, and I wasn't <laughs> used to it. <laughs> Let's just say that. And what had happened was this chicken bone got lodged into my uh, body and I had to go to the emergency room in the middle of the night and have it like removed. And so this was like a crazy situation. I know it's like, a, you can laugh, it's okay. And so I end up at the emergency room and they're like two in the morning in the morning. I'm like, hey man, I can't pee. I can't go to the bathroom. I'm going to about to blow up. I got this massive pain and they're like, they don't know what it is. So, so any the, anyway, the doctors helped me out. It gets removed, and uh, you can take your own imagination on that. It was not fun. And uh, the next morning, I go to the you know fields, and I tell the trainers, and they, they can't even look at me seriously. They're just laughing the whole time. And then I tell the coaches, and I'm, I, they're just laughing. They wouldn't even talk to me. I would, they were just like hysterically laughing. You've got to be kidding me. And so it kind of went on, and I'm supposed to pitch that morning, and uh, – I'm in the dugout, and this one coach, I think we called him Shifty was his name, or Lefty. I don't remember now. It was either Shifty or Lefty, and he walks by, and he kind of looks down at me, and I'm in the dugout already warmed up. He's like, you all right today? I go, yeah, yeah, I'll be all right. He goes, uh, you had a rough night? I'm like, yeah, it was a rough night, but uh, I'm ready to go. He takes a step, pulls out a chicken wing bone out of his back of his you know, baseball pants, throws it on the ground, and he goes, well, how did that get in there? And you know, of course, the whole team was in on it. The coaches, they were videoing it from behind the backstop. And so they made a big joke about me having a chicken bone stuck in my butt at the New York Yankees organization. So my the story was that they sent the video up to the clubhouse during the World Series, and I was known as the chicken bone. So no longer the Olympic javelin thrower, I was Mr. Chicken Bone. So that's my historic event with the Yankees. That's what I'm known for. <laughs> That is a good story. And, you know, speaking of Olympic javelin thrower, like you got the opportunity to, to have like a, a home Olympics and, and throw in 96. How was that experience? I know you had a great meet and, and like, what was it like, you know, um, throwing in? Well, to get, yeah, to get serious, the, the most moving experience of my life uh, was walking in to the stadium and noticing all the Atlanta locals crying. And I'm like, wow, what are they crying about? You know? And then I realized it was pride, pride that their time had come to host the Olympic games. And they were here in the United States and well, you know, there's something special about the games everywhere. We went wearing a U.S. uniform all over the world. We were cheered. Um, you know, everybody was envious of that U S flag and the U S outfits. And, uh, you know, I loved having the United States written on my jacket and, uh, so just having it home and the pride, it's the pride. It's too hard to explain. It's one of those feelings you want to share with everybody. It's amazing, amazing feeling to have. That's very cool. And, and how did you, you know, after your competitive career, how did you transition from being a world-class competitor to getting into coaching? Thankfully, I had already lined up a sports performance business. So I went from being an athlete to being a coach. And after a few years or even a year, uh, even my wife said, I didn't know you'd transition that easy. I thought you'd be a lot more psycho, you know, about uh, losing sport. And uh, I was grateful that I and I really appreciated being Coach Tom. So I had learned all these things around the world and I could now help others and I could see I was impacting young athletes. And it was uh, extremely valuable to me because there was one time in my career I sat on a runway and I actually asked myself, what am I offering to society? What value am I offering? And I thought, well, it's like a minor entertainment value of very little substance. And this really bothered me emotionally. Uh, I wasn't, I did, I lost my motivation a little bit because I didn't understand what, where I fit in, in the world. And I said, I can't just be a consumer and then enjoy, you know, what I'm doing. It's like selfish. It wasn't, I wasn't helping enough. And when I became a coach and I was out there being able to support other athletes and I realized like, oh yeah, now I don't have to worry about what I'm doing for society. Very cool. And, you know, I would imagine some of those, you know, experience you had as a, as a, you know, traveling the world, getting to work and, and train and, and socialize with all these other throwers. I know you have some mm -hmm. good friends on that throwing circuit as an athlete. How oh, those tons. friendships 
affected your coaching? So what's cool about me is I was the American in the javelin throw. So meaning like in the United States, there's probably a thousand guys that can coach a shot put pretty well. And there's probably a hundred guys that can coach it incredibly well. Same thing in the discus, but in the javelin, <laughs> okay, we're down to a few and uh, it goes down dramatically. Rob, I hope you would agree with that. Okay. So, you know, I've traveled around the country doing clinics and camps and there are people who really Sorry. Okay, good. Sorry. You got me now? All right. Yep. So, uh, for a second. you're good. All right. I'm good. So, there. Are, so, I was uh, on a seek, on a, a research assignment. Um, I went all over the world and got a chance to train in Lithuania, the Soviet Union. I mean, in Japan, the Finns, I spent 15 years in a row in Finland. The Germans are my best friends. They came to train with me. So my coaching information is uh, international. Uh, you know, about a decade ago, somebody mentioned all oh, the American style of throwing. And I was I was laughing at laughing at this concept. I'm like, what are you kidding me? We've been helped by the, you know, by someone from another land for the 35 years so you know people in this country grow up baseball players so the generally you know we go into javelin so yeah we're a little more arm focused than like guys in finland but they don't have uh you know what is a baseball contract nowadays you can be a pitcher and make 250 million dollars you know well they don't have this distraction in Finland. <laughs> so they, the, the best throwing guy is like, oh, you should be a javelin thrower, where the best throwing guy here is like, javelin, why would you do that? So something along those lines, something along those lines. So um, what I, my uh, my experience is such that I'm, I've learned how to get the best of the uh, what's out there and be able to deliver it, and I, and I love being in that position now. It's awesome. Nice. And having like absorbed kind of all that information from, you know, various throwers around the world and your own experiences, could you explain, you know, your style of coaching the javelin and, and your philosophy surrounding mm -hmm. the event? Yeah, it's uh, changed a little bit over the years. Uh, you know, in my private sports performance business, I trained about 10,000 athletes of various levels. I have a lot of athletes that have gone on at a pro level. I didn't train them to be pros. They were already great when they came to me. I just want to make that clear. I don't take responsibility for that. But I had some, you know, say so in their development over the years at some point. Uh, so I have tried many different methods on many different style of athletes. And so that has dictated how I train people. I'm, I'm a CSCS. I don't hold a, uh, designation anymore. I don't keep, keep up with it, but I became CSCS and that certified strength and conditioning specialist for about 12 years. I held that. And then you have this international training experience myself and watching other international athletes. So, where have I learned a little bit? Um, in my era, strength and power, um, you know, we went from the 70s and 80s from the beautiful finesse throwers of the era. They threw beautifully. They threw an old rules javelin that required some finesse and artistic ability. And then you saw some bigger, stronger guys throw far. So we thought, oh, you got to be big and strong. And in reality, we got a little carried away in the 90s with power and strength. And then I watched it kind of go back to a gymnastic capacity with the likes of Taro Pete Kamaki and, and Andreas Thorkelson and the ladies of the era of 2003 to 2010. And I was so grateful for those athletes because they said, I said to myself, now they're representing the way to throw that I think is the ideal way. So there's a, I, I, when I teach my friends who are, whether they're college coaches or pros, I say to them, all I do different is I basically take 10 to 15% off the weightlifting I did, maybe 20, and then add gymnastics training and flexibility into that. And that's it. It's just a small shift. It's not a paradigm change, just a shift. I should paradigm shift, I should say. So just a modest, modest shift. And so I relinquish some of the weightlifting I used to do. I don't let the, my athletes do as much as I did. I think it was ludicrous what I did. And uh, I try to get them to do more specialty strength training and specialty strength and gymnastic capacity. And um, that was shown to me by the best guys in the world. And now you look at someone like, a, you know, Thomas uh, Roller, and um, it's, it's awesome to see a guy who's basically like Spider-Man throwing the javelin. <laughs> yeah. Um, 
Very cool. And I, I have got a ton of list of questions I could blabber on, but I want to make sure we work in some of these from YouTube that people are sending in. Um, All right. So we'll start with uh, Sue. Sue just submitted a, a, a question of, you know, how would you teach a female um, who has no experience in throwing objects to throw the javelin? And I'm going to second that working with a lot of, of female multis in, in where, I, where I work. I do this all the time. <laughs> so what do I do? I use weighted balls and I go over the basics of, of the power position. So that's for a right-handed athlete. That's when the left leg touches the ground and the position of the arm being fully stretched. And I try to explain the sequence of the body coming from the core through the armpit and the shoulder rotation at the top. Maybe you can see me where you pronate your shoulder over to release and I try to explain that sequence and take them through it. And I teach it with flexibility every day, with a ball throw every day, and so a few other drills like medicine ball throws. But generally speaking, we do some sort of arch, two-arm stretch every single day, uh, something to protect the shoulder and the scapula with this, like a reverse action with a bungee cord. We stretch with bungee cords every day and try to make a throwing motion with a bungee cord. And then I try to remind people where their leg position should be. So if you could imagine, if they're able to see what Rob has behind his head, that picture of the javelin thrower, can you put that up, Brandon? Yeah. So it's perfect. So you got the left leg on the ground, the arm is fully back, and um, the right knee in reality should be a little more bent, and you could be further back. This is maybe more of a later position in the throw than the initial catch position. So in a nutshell, to be more simple is you have to throw a weighted ball into a wall. It gives you a chance to do a lot of repetition. And I just try to make sure that they're flexible and going through a long range of motion. Mm. Very cool. And it's a simple technique. And, and another question that came through, it sounded like you, you mentioned throwing in some way, shape or form a weighted ball every day. Al, Al Farshidian is asking, you know, how many days do you throw per week and, and what does that volume look like? We alter between two and three days a week, and the volume can be dramatic. When the, my 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 training group, which is our, our Olympic hopefuls and ones an Olympian, and and they're very high level, uh, eight meter four in there. Uh, we have uh, Maggie Malone, who's a sixty four meter javelin thrower, with me. Um, I have uh, several others of merit, and uh, the the. The training load is pretty dramatic. I would call it between the ball throws and the javelin throws somewhere along the lines of 100 to 160 throws in a workout two to three days a week. Now, mind you, those are not high intensity efforts. When the intensity rises, like if you're throwing far outside, it's a 15 to 25, 30 throws, depending on the athlete's comfort level. But I tend to err on the side of caution now. I don't expect people to be, you know, a little bit over the top like me and obsessive. And I keep the number down before they uh, challenge themselves. I'm very worried about injuries nowadays, much more than I was for myself. I didn't really didn't worry about that. Now I just um, uh, I try to make sure we get uh, enough work, but stay injury free. Um, and and sounds like you have you have relatively big ranges of throws. Or what are some yes. markers? You know, if you're you know, if you if you are taking a hard throw, day so uh, in life. I'll tell you right now. I'll tell you right now, Brandon. Here's my my workout for my athletes. It's pretty simple. What we got this week. Now, mind you, we're on lockdown and we're training at a grade school across from my house, and we do have a wall to throw at. But Monday, Wednesday, Friday is our throwing day. Yesterday we threw a little harder. We warmed up with javelin mobility and flexibility and cord stretching. Uh, then we threw uh, four sets of ten with a heavier ball. About a one kilo for the girls, oh, two kilo for the boys, standing throw. But we used a bungee cord to pull from the waist. We attach it to our waist. And, and the bungee cords I bought from Rob, by the way, and I still have them, Rob. I use them all the time. And we assist into a block to make the block pressure much greater. And we just go as relaxed as possible. And we do 40 throws. So four sets of 10. And then... Um, we would, but once we also do the uh, cord stretching, three sets of 10, where you're leaving your hand back and turning your knee and hip forward. Uh, but with that cord stretching, we did a reverse stretch. So you do like a backhanded effort to uh, help, like a therapeutic exercise for the scapula. 
And then we went to throw a javelin. And so my, my instructions to the group were, I want you guys to start with flat landings today. No picking into the ground. I want everybody to stay up. And you landed flat. And I said, start at easy throws, 10, 15 yards. But today you're going to climb like a ladder. Every throw is a little further, 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 further. But we're establishing a technique that our priority yesterday was the block. It's all about the pl- impact of the block first and the arm second. If you're not having an intent or content on your throw, you're not throwing with a, with a really smart practice. So we were pretty tight on our tolerances and discipline yesterday. And my kids picked up the pace and they went further and further. And once they threw kind of comfortably off a of three to five steps, I said, okay, send it. And one of my athletes had uh, PR in practice. Uh, practice PR, not his all-time best, but he's like, I don't normally throw that far in practice. So I'm very excited about that. Nice. And, and if you are like in a, a set of, of hard throws, when do you know when to shut it down? Or what are some markers you look for of like, okay, this time, time to shut it down before we risk anything? Super question. So as soon as I see a breakdown of technique, I pull the plug and then I do an intervention. I know when, uh, this is great. I, I say, okay, we're done. And they hate when I do that to them. They hate it, but then they are thanking me later. So what we typically do is we'll, I'll stop them from throwing hard and then we'll set, we'll go back to standing throws where they pronate and hit the point into the ground at a target at, you know, 30, 40% effort. But I want them to hit clean javelins and not twist away and not turn away because typically when they're throwing hard, they start to break down, twisting too much, breaking down the knee. And I said, let's go back to what we do. Basically do the basics, hold the plant, fire the hip, get everything in lined up, make it clean. And then when they do that, they're like, yeah, okay, now I'm back. And then I sometimes let them throw a little harder on the grass. And then it, what's, what's funny is sometimes we see, especially the girls, you know, they'll, let's say they're throwing 160, uh, 50 meters in training, 52. And then they start throwing 48, 49, and it's lo- losing their point. We go to the grass, we start throwing 25 meters, 30 meters, 40 meters. And then all of a sudden off the grass, they hit, 48 49 50 with half the effort they took to throw 51 or two 20 minutes before that it's amazing when you relax people and then they start doing their technique how great they get (laughs) so we do this all the time and uh this is something that no one none of them have ever done and they appreciate this in my style because i always i never want them to leave a practice disappointed and um they told me that they would throw a lot with their other coaches, which are great guys. I'm not knocking anybody, but they would throw and then they wouldn't do well. They'd leave, they'd go lift the next day or that day. And then they'd come back the next time and try to redo it again. And I'm like, I don't want to leave until you have some sort of sense of balance and coordination that you're prouder of. And so I don't like disappointment in practice. I like people to be fired up and excited. Nice. Uh, Scrolling through these questions. Um, So before, before you go on, Brandon, so, we're going to throw again tomorrow. So tomorrow's workout, it's, I wrote down, warm up to throw, which means they jog and stretch. They know what to do. It's it's uh, not extraordinary, but it's let's say it's 20 minutes of work to prepare yourself with mobility with a javelin. And I wrote uh, plate mobility. And that's a simple arm swings with like a two and a half kilo or even a five kilo plate, depending on your strength. So forward and backward, about three sets of 10 each way. And then I have a lighter ball throw. So we're going to use these 450 gram balls uh, that we have. Uh, Some of them will be the ones that Rob gave us. And um, he gave us these great 500 gram balls, these yellow balls that MNF sells. We, we use, they don't, they don't break. I mean, we can hammer them into a wall and they they keep together. Uh, I wrote down harder throws from three steps at the wall. So they're going to be tired from Monday. So they will not take a heavy load tomorrow. Mm. So I will, I will, go into it what do you think our technique is going to be tomorrow hold the left leg (laughs) and stay close it's the same thing i'll be very adamant about that and then um we will throw uh, javelin throwing outside and i wrote medium day as comfortable drill throws and target throws only so i will not let them throw hard tomorrow whether they want to or not i'll rein them in very cool and then friday uh warm up to throw mobility and various stretches Rogies and backovers, these are two drills like you lay on your stomach and you uh, roll the ball to somebody, they pick it up over their head and throw it back while they're laying on their stomach. It's a great arch type flexibility throw. Uh, then two arm med balls, three sets of 10, not meant to be crazy. And then javelin throwing as comfortable. 
what I suspect Friday, they're all going to be really hurting. So I will probably limit the guys who normally throw 65 to 68 beaters in training or 70. They'll be throwing 55, mm. 53 meters. You know, the girls, uh, Avion throws far in practice, 52, 53. Uh, I won't let her throw past 45, you know, 43. I'll, I'll put a flag out and say, that's it, babe. That's all you get. Work it. You find and that's your, it. Do you find your athletes hate that the first couple of times they work with you, the, the range throwing? Exactly. And then, they, then they're then really proud of themselves because when I uh, – I give them the chance to, I always give them opportunities to succeed and they, they know that I'm in their, viewing their best interest and they trust me now far more. After a few months, they trusted me and, uh, and they, I think they're performing much better as a result. I just don't want them to hurt themselves. Yeah. That's awesome. Uh, Angelo's asking, um, can you take us through the last three steps of the throw and what key factors you're looking for in these moments? Okay, so the faster you throw, the more patient you have to be. If you're going in thinking you have to fire your arm more, this is a misnomer for sub-international athletes, the greatest athletes in the world. We've discussed it. I've been around them. I've seen Zelezny throw 100 competitions. I've asked Roller, Andreas Hoffman. I've spent time with uh, Mick, you know, the top girls of, of several eras. I don't spend as much time now with the top ladies, but I do spend time with Kara and Ari, our best girls in the country. and all to every single one of those athletes are patient till the legs hit the ground and then they start to work. So, uh, as you're running up to throw, you have to think about having a great impulse left uh, off your left leg impulse step. And then you have to be patient and maintain your position. If you're already prepping to throw and turning open too much or ripping your left arm at that point, you're in big trouble. Uh, so you're trying to stay patient, stay close to the sector and keep your left shoulder as high up as possible. And then once your legs set, your impact of your right hip is a, is a non volunt It's a voluntary action. I'm sorry. It's an involuntary action. It's not something you do. It's something that is an involuntary action of the left leg hitting the right hip goes forward a few centimeters that stretches the arm and off goes the javelin. So remember the javelin throw happens in less than two tenths of a second. So to give you guys some idea. So Zelezny's world record, his center of mass only moved four to six centimeters from the time he planted to the time he released. That's about two inches. And he's running up at 13 miles an hour, about uh, 6.8 meters per second. Okay. So it only took from the time he blocked till the time it released 14 hundredths of a second. So in other words, you have to be set up to hit and go. If you are doing any kind of twisting, getting underneath it and all those things, the throw is already done. You're already going to blow past it and um, you're going to struggle to get wonder why you're making some errors. So in my case, I threw 87 meters, 11 meters short of that guy named Zelezny, which is, feels pit, pitiful. But in reality, I, I threw 85 a lot and was doing pretty good in my day. So my throw took... Uh, 0.21 seconds, two tenths of a second to occur. My center of mass moved about 12 centimeters. So basically he stopped and ripped and I cushioned the blow from my legs a little bit. I couldn't transfer the energy immediately, but I still blocked well enough to throw 87 meters. And the same person who calculated the biomechanist is Klaus Bartonitz, who calculated and analyzed those throws told me that if, yeah, if you hold your left and Move your, stop your center of mass in a couple of centimeters like Zelezny, you would have thrown 91 or two, <laughs> something like that. Maybe, but I couldn't do it no matter what I did. I just physically and genetically incapable. But uh, so something like that. So what I want, my point is, is that when you are throwing farther, what you're thinking is more about stopping and staying stable than throwing harder. That's the number one point I wanted to get to. So I had to explain mm -hmm. why. And so the better you get, the less you are voluntarily throwing the javelin. It is an involuntary action. And when you ask Andreas Hoffman, Vetter, Roller, and the top girls, they'll tell you, I'm more patient and I stop harder. Hmm. And could you, obviously the block is hugely important. Could you explain to us a little bit more um, the importance of that block, specifically, you know, 
the mechanics of how that non-throwing arm, you know, contributes to the block and what it's doing throughout that, you know, the end of that throw. Yeah, I've been a little bit mean to some people on the internet that are posting on for. I, I'm not a guy who uh, sells um, or has a website that I charge for, so I, I'm very happy to offer information. And the best way to find it is on our Instagram for my group that trains. We put everything we do on there so people can watch and try to learn from us. I, I'm happy to help. Um, I don't. I, I don't like to. Uh, I've been asked to do a couple of these. Um, you know, Zoom meetings and get char- be charging people, and it's not for me. I prefer to give it for free and let people handle that knowledge. So one of the things I see is there, a lot of guys are trying to get the edge into what's going on. And uh, a couple of guys, and they're good people, I don't mean the personal, but they're teaching to pull the left arm in and, like, turn up as you hit the block. Uh and some people are even teaching to push the hip all the way forward before the block hits to load uh, load your arm. And I'm thinking, how do you load in air? How do you load anything without leverage? It's not physically possible. You can't create a spring unless you stop one point, stretch, and respond is what a real throw is. So um, the left arm, to, set, to put it mildly, since about 1996, this has been a discussion between I can name off names. Uh, anybody in Germany to, of any merit who's thrown anything over 85 meters, uh, any coach, any athlete, Tersis Lieberberg out of South Africa, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Finns, Kim O'Kinnonen, uh, Mickey Langberg, Kari Ihalainen, one of the best, best coaches in the world, Anders Borgstrom, the coach of the, the incredible Taiwanese thrower. I love Anders. Um, most people that I talk to, no one discusses pulling their left arm before the block hits. No one, no one does it. No one tries to, it's an involuntary action. You do it automatically. So if we teach an over overturn or aggressive pulling of your left arm, you just simply shorten the motion and you open yourself up, you'll crush your lower back. You're shortening the whole throw. And, um, It won't happen as well as you think it can. You have to try to stay back as best as you can. In my teachings of javelin throwers, this works for 99 out of 100 athletes. There might be an outlier where you might have to say, oh, you know what? If you pull your left arm out, it might help a little bit. But if you do do that to everybody, I'm saying 90% of the people will make the mistake of overturning. Can you understand that, Brandon? I hope that that's clear enough. So. So the bottom line is what I want to make clear is try to try to move your body to your block arm. And only when your right arm comes forward, does your left arm come in. Hmm. If you want to see the drills that we do, then go to our USA Javelin Project Instagram. We're not selling anything. Oh, we do sell T-shirts, but don't, you know, nobody has to buy anything. But <laughs> you know what I mean? Go check what we do and you'll see the drills. Very cool. If you're going to buy anything, buy it from Rob at m f Athletic. <laughs> In seriousness, I actually buy from Rob. He's a great guy. Um, very cool. And, you know, sticking with some, with some technical pieces here, um, what mm-hmm. do you feel like is, you know, a thrower's biggest asset or your biggest asset in creating a far throw? Oh, your legs. Your legs and your core. Oh, my gosh. Arms are great. Arms are great. But don't be dismayed if you don't have a cannon for an arm. If you have a good core and legs, you are you can be a killer. Zelezny once said to me in, in a beautiful way that, and he was making fun of me in a way too. Uh, he said, "You know, Tom, the arm is very good, but the legs have a lot of potential." So I don't know if he was talking to me. I'm guaranteeing he was, but I'm, I'm sure he was. But what he meant was if you can use your legs and be very aggressive and a great runner and with a good block and you can get yourself set up with your legs, you have the potential to throw very, very well. You don't have to have a 100-mile-per-hour arm if you're a boy to be a great javelin thrower. But you have to have some pretty good legs and gymnastic capacity through your core. Mm. And we, we it seems like we keep coming back to the importance of the block. We've talked a lot about that. Um, and um, – Ron is asking, how do you get developmental athletes to be comfortable in that block? So, uh, you know, I coach at the local high school because then I'm allowed to use the facilities for my pros. And it's I'm not aff- affiliated with a college, and uh, I, I'm okay with that. So 
uh, because I do too much work nationally and internationally. If I'm with the university, I'm, un- I'm not allowed to work with the high school kids that I get to work with. So what do we look for? Um, you try to explain to them. Uh, I first put them into position. So what happens, it's a matter of positioning. So we, uh, if you're very much on top of your block, like it's, think of it as a pole vault. If uh, you were to plant in a box, like, well, I guess it's, too, it's not, not quite the same. But if you block upright, it's for easy for you to just blow past it and fall down. So the first thing I teach is an angle to stay back. And then I try to take them through that feeling. And I try to teach the feeling by using the bungee cords and stretching devices first, and then maybe a ball throw. So uh, we teach the block by uh, making sure that it's at a dramatic angle, not an upright position. Mm-hmm number one. And then the second thing we teach is to separate the back leg movement from the front leg movement. So how do I do that? I'll try to describe a drill I do that should be on my Instagram. You put your back foot on a six inch box in the middle of the box and you put your left leg on the ground and all you do is turn your knee and fire your glute, your right butt cheek, fire your gluteus into the block, but don't come off the box. And then you make your throw. Don't come off the box. So simply, the box is like a lever that shortens your right leg, makes it easier for you to have a feeling in your muscles. And when you teach somebody a feeling, I say a lot less in practice than you would imagine. I just teach a sensation. And once an athlete learns that sensation, hey, they can pretty much do it and repeat it. And so I put them the right foot on the box, let them turn it into the left leg, and then they make a throw. And it's amazing how that drill works. It's Mm -hmm. amazing. And so, and then Brendan, the other one is, and uh, we hold on to the bungee cord with our left hand and then make a throwing action. So you're not, you know, pulling the left side away. Yeah. Teaching that patience. Yeah. It's basic things. It's basic things. It's not, it's not brain surgery, but what happens is young people are trying, try so hard. And, uh, I, I, I have worked with these NSAF javelin kids and you know, what all their ingredients are that they're all really aggressive and because they're so aggressive, they're great. And so sometimes we just have to kind of keep them calm and keep working technique. And then once they get it isolated, then they're, you just get out of their way and they'll, they'll kill it for you, you know? Mm-hmm. Very so cool. it's about teaching, it's teaching simple things and, uh, every day. Awesome. And we've had a couple of questions about the wrap um, and what your thoughts are on the, on a wrap. Mm. Do you, do you, or what percentage your athletes use it? And then a specific question from John is he coaches a wheelchair seated javelin thrower. And what do you oh, take wow. on trying to use that wrap in that seated position for those athletes? Loaded All right. I have there. worked with, I've had worked with uh, Paralympic athletes who work from a seated position. So they don't have the gifts of, uh, you know, the ground to steal pressure from. So they have to use their abdomen as much as possible. So let me explain it like this. A standing throw for an able-bodied person with legs uh, requires you to rotate, wrap, almost do these enormous things. And you can follow through and reverse and do whatever it takes to get your longest throw. But if you were trying to throw a standing throw that mimics world-class technique from a run, you don't do any of those wrapping and super long, wide turns and, you know, loss of stability. But in order to get to generate force from a standstill, you have to do a lot of crazy things with your body. Let's say that. So for the wheelchair athlete, they need to, or someone in a chair needs to elongate as much tissue as they can afford to use that is available to you. So you lean back as much as you can, and then you focus on a clean flight. So if you can combine the longest aspect you possibly can through the core, through your ribs, whatever is available, depending on the athlete, depending on how, what their abilities are, and you, you obviously work on elongation of your action. That's number one. So wrapping, mm-hmm. no problem if you're in a wheelchair or chair athlete. Uh, I advise it to get the most out of yourself because you're not moving. Now the running athlete. So the really the wrap is, it's, it's again, it's, it's been mis, misrepresented for many, many years. The wrap, if you take a look at all throwers, um, no one throws not facing the sector. But when they run, like if you watch Zelezny, he presents extremely sideways. I got an anecdotal story on Zelezny. He wrapped his javelin so much that in London, in a meet, I watched him, you know, rotate. And he's running totally, almost 
you know, like his left hip is facing the sector and his shoulders closed off and the javelin's aiming to the right sector, to the right stance. And uh, his tail of his javelin was outside of the runway and it hit the Lucasade bottle cooler, like a, you know, big, like a, I don't know, like a 50 gallon or 30 gallon drone that's upright what they put drinks in for us, for the athletes. And he hit it with his javelin and, you know, he's, mad he was really steaming mad i remember him like saying a few swears i don't know what they were it's in czech you know the czech language but he was upset and i was like wow i never seen anything like that and of course he threw super far that night i think it was 92 12 i was there so i remember um so in reality the rap is more about how you present your run and what's comfortable to you and what you're great at so here's how i'll define it uh you want to throw in a good alignment at all costs. You have to be aligned. Whether you're forward or rotated sideways, you have to get the javelin to fly well. Every athlete offers their athletic ability dependent upon how they feel comfortable. Some athletes are more comfortable forward and some are more rotated. So there's no one way. There is no, I don't really want to describe it as a wrap. To me, the wrap is, it's not a throwing dis- style. It's more of a run-up style. Mm. So you're, I would call it that you start to teach facing a little more forward, keep it linear. And as an athlete progressive progresses, there is more benefits to being somewhat rotational in your hips, legs, as you can get from further back. So you're trying to teach an athlete to pull. And if it requires you to rotate your feet, which rotates your torso, which rotates your body to get the maximum pull, go for it. Absolutely teach it. So I don't like to dis, uh, call a wrap or linear but it's easier for the javelin world to be described if you describe an athlete like are they more rotational or more linear thrower but um there's not a wrapping throwing technique there's a block there's physics involved you can't you know, argue with science but some athletes throw much more rotation than others steve backley former legend through very linear one of the best javelin throwers in history one of the greatest competitors i ever saw Great guy, uh, incredible under pressure. And then you see Zelezny in the same track meet, and I'm like, what a two different worlds. And they're throwing similarly, 89, 90 meters. But Zelezny is running so far sideways, you're like, how is how is this possible? But I know Zelezny trained this way, and Backley's like, you know, I don't even have a run-up. I just start running up, and when I see the line, I wail on it. He was that gifted. He can, he can. I remember training with him on run-up, and I said, how many cross-steps do you do? He goes, I'm not sure. I just uh, know when I got to pull back and hit it. Nice. <laughs> um, but he's also extraordinary. <laughs> yeah. And um, Sue Humphrey is asking, you know, how does oh, baseball... Oh, I love Sue. Hi, Sue. <laughs> <laughs> um, She's a great lady. How does a baseball tri- pitcher um, translate to a good javel- javelin thrower, and do they? And, and I'm going to expand that just a little bit of what other sports do you feel like ma- end up making good javelin throwers? Okay, volleyball is better. Volleyball. Mm. Volleyball. So what happens with baseball is you get the guy with the rifle and softball. So two, three years ago, the USOC gave us some money, and me and Kara Winger and a few other uh, coaches went out to the Chula Vista, and we trained professional baseball and softball players and one quarterback, and they were all elite level, 95-mile-per-hour types that signed professional contracts. And uh, the one lefty who threw a baseball 95 miles an hour, built like a brick, you know, ship, um, strong fella, uh, big guy, 225 pounds, lefty. The best he can do within an hour was 160, 170 in the jab. Hmm. That's it. And the USOC was prepared to invite someone to stay at the Olympic Training Center and train if we found a guy that, like a Petronov, who first time he ever throws a javelin, 230. If we found that person or girl, we would have actually been able to find some funding hmm. to get them to stay at the training center and train believe it or not. So this is not something I want to talk about too much because javelin people get upset because why are we putting it into the current javelin door as well? We had a special fund, special program, very not a huge amount of money to invite these people to see if we can find someone outside of the box of our track and field system and see if they can do it. And we basically proved that it's a lot harder to throw far than it really, it, it, it's a lot harder than it, it seems because you got people that are elite in their sport i mean they're not all hall, hall of fame pros uh but they're elite level baseball and softball people and the girls do about 130 boys do 160 170 hmm. so 
Um, what other sports do we go through? I just, I will go back to volleyball. It's going to be volleyball. And of course, baseball, the problem with baseball is they're taught to throw down the pitchers are taught to throw it down with a softer left leg. And in reality, if you can't keep your legs straight in the javelin, I don't care what kind of arm you have, you will not keep up to the international set. Hmm. Nice. So you got to recruit those volleyball players. Yes. <laughs> um, and, you know, this kind and of tennis and tennis. Oh, yeah, the serving. That's very interesting. Yeah, they're athletes. I could. They're incredible athletes. Yeah, very cool. And to kind of pivot a little bit away from technique, we might be able to get back to some of that stuff. But um, you know, talking about some of the work you've done, you know, nationally and internationally with USA Track and Field, I'm I'm really curious to hear about your project right now, the USA Javelin project. Mm. What is it? How yeah. it came about? How's it going? Uh, we'd love to hear about that. I've gotten to a point in life where uh, I'm about as happy as you could possibly be as a human being for his sport. Uh, I I just love to be able to coach and I've been surrounded by extraordinary people. Uh, I love the sport of track and field and I'm able to uh, be part of the nicest things in the sport in the United States right now. And one is the national scholastic athletic programs uh, project javelin. It's a program that Jeff Gorski started in 2011, but he's no longer able to be part of it because he coaches at UNC and they put the block on him uh, a year and a half ago and is unable to be with us, which is tough. It's strained our relationship, unfortunately, uh, but I won't get into that. But um, it bothers me on a daily basis that he can't be part of the javelin scene with high school kids because he's a, if you ever been around Gorski, he's a, no one's more passionate than he in the world in the javelin no one no one even me i don't have what he has but i'm somewhere in the same neighborhood but um so the nsaf funds the top four girls and the top four boys in the high school ranks we pick them try to get them like freshman and sophomore year and we take them to about five or six events a year and this year we had plans to go to finland and we do a clinic and we did a clinic in baton rouge that rob was part of and we did one here in birmingham alabama in the fall and then we have sioux falls we have the Jav Fest in East Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania, and all those things are funded for those athletes in the program, and I'm able to come as well. And my colleagues, coaching staff in there is Barry Kramis, a 79-meter javelin throw himself, and Kim Hamilton, who has been ranked in the top three in the U.S. on five occasions. And so we all know what to teach. Uh, we've Kim O'Kinnonen, the world champion Finn, has been part of this program on about 20 occasions. He's flown to the States to coach the athletes we've been in Finland training with them. So we continue to do what he has taught. And then actually in 20, the fall of 18, we, we brought in Thomas Roller, and he was our head coach for three days. And I don't know where to begin. That was so spectacular, having the reigning Olympic champion coaching a bunch of kids to kids, I think would have trained 12 hours that day if we let him. Uh, it was an amazing situation. And I actually had Raymond Hecht, who has about the fifth longest thrown history with him. So the former German, German record holder with the superstar Thomas Roller. It was an amazing situation. So we're providing, the U NSAF provides an extraordinary situation and experience for these athletes. And we support it with world-class coaching and uh, great support. And then USA Javelin Project uh, last May at Tucson. Rob, you funded the darn barbecue there. And the next night, Maggie Malone, 2016 Olympian, walked up to me and said, hey, would you coach me? Now, I've had like this open door policy for 15, 20 years since I've retired. Anybody can come over anytime, two or three days at my house, spend the night with, spend the night here. I got guest quarters and we train. And um, a lot of people have come through the doors, lots. Uh, some people have stayed for a year. Some people have stayed for a week. So we call them either long-term dwellers or short-term dwellers. And if you uh, use the lettering, that's LTD or STD, but we won't get into that <laughs> again. And uh, so that's a little joke we have with the kids that would come to see us. So these uh, Maggie decided to be an LTD. So she said, I'm moving to Birmingham. And I panicked at first. I didn't know if I could do it with the surrounding people I have and facilities, but after a few days of talking to some people and absolutely we got the job done. So we have some like therapists that are available. Uh, we work out at Hoover high school, which is the finest high school facility in the state. Uh, and we get access to some of the universities in the area, but with the lockdown, that's going to change a little, but we'll be okay. 
And uh, I also have five other kids that have moved to town to train. So we got Maggie Malone, Rebecca Wales, who's an All-American from LSU. Um, I have Avion Allgood, former high school national record holder, 196 for 60 meter javelin thrower. Avion is with me. Um, from a distance, I have Curtis Thompson, who will be moving here. He's the former U.S. champion and uh, NCAA champion and runner up at NCAAs last year. Uh, he'll be moving here in June or July whenever he can get down from um, New Jersey. And then my local guys are Sam Harden, who is originally from Auburn, Alabama, but has moved here to train. And he's a 274 and a half meter javelin thrower from a and uh, Ethan Shalloway, who's a 74 and a half meter javelin thrower from Kentucky. And Justin Carter, who is a 73 meter javelin thrower from formerly of Auburn. And um, so those numbers aren't terribly impressive yet for those boys. But if you saw them this spring, it was pretty clear that those meter distances were no longer going to be their personal best. <laughs> we always like that. Uh, we like it a little bit better when we get the chance to show it. But um... <laughs> it's a shame for I feel so badly for so many high school young people who have had their time stolen. My college kids are they're they're not just good javelin throwers, they're really great people and it was very frustrating, but the fact is is about 2 days in we realized that okay, this is a major international concern and they reserved the fact that if we don't get to compete this year, it's the way it is. The world and people are more important than sport. And that was mm. unbelievable of them as an attitude. And, uh, so I'm proud to be associated with these kids, not just from as a coach, but as a friend. Awesome. That's very cool. Um, I know you guys, you have training coming up here in, in a few short minutes. Yeah, they're um, outside warming up. They'll be fine. <laughs> they can warm up. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we won't keep you much longer, but do you have time for one or two more questions? Absolutely. I tell you, I can get, I can go to about five ten, and I'm so grateful to have this opportunity because, uh, you know, I love what I do, and uh, to share it with people is very, how do you say, uh, it makes me makes life valuable for me. So I appreciate it very much. No, we we appreciate you coming on very much. Um, I guess a couple of the big questions we still have left. Um, what's been asked a couple of times, you know, Rob posted it up on on the YouTube feed. How does an emerging elite athlete throwing in that seventy five to seventy eight meter range? get to that world-class 85 meter and above range? What, what are the kind of those next steps? So uh, you have to have, you have to have fierce independence. Um, if you rely on everybody else to help you, if you think USA track and field will give you funding or pay for you to be an athlete, you're crazy. Uh, I just don't want to, I mean, so you have to have is this incredible independence where like Tom Petronoff, tell him that he can't do it and then watch him do it right in front of your face. So if you want to be an international javelin thrower in this country, you first have to have the guts to throw it all away, all your other things that you might enjoy away and put yourself in a position to be a javelin thrower. Mm -hmm. And if you do that, uh, you have a, that's your first step. The second step is try to find a location that's friendly to allowing you to be on their campus and there with, and, and, and not, you know, kick you off or, and, and have some comfort in your daily training regime. Third thing is find a good coach. There's a lot of them out there that are very helpful and supportive and, and don't keep looking for other coaching. Once you're with somebody, learn together. If you have to, there's so many quality throws coaches that, and there's such good people in the NCAA ranks that, okay, they may not be known for their javelin knowledge, but I know these guys. They're like the greatest guys I know. They're my colleagues. I, I, I'm proud to call them my friends and people that I uh, re respect tremendously. And some of them are my heroes, for Christ's sake. So um, if you find one of these people, they're worth their weight in gold, and they'll help you, whether they know perfect javelin or not. You can learn together. Awesome. So that's what I would tell an emerging elite athlete. And then what do you do? Well, you know, javelin throwing was a mystery 30 years ago. We didn't have all the information. We'd get pieces and stuff once a year to, you know, Anders Borgstrom or Kari would come to the States to teach us in the fall. And then we'd roll with it, kind of hear what the history of foreign javelin throwers were doing. You hear in anecdotal pieces. Well, now you got YouTube and you got all these different websites. The hard part now is to filter out what's, bad information and the only thing i've seen out there that's kind of questionable is that left arm pull and throwing your hip forward before the block happens that they don't they haven't analyzed uh elite javelin throwing 
whoever's teaching that, nor have they been around the best guys in the world. And they're just assuming actions that are, that they've seen this, they feel like they're seeing, but that's not what is being think. That's not what the athlete's thinking. And unless you know what they're thinking, you're assuming things. And that means you can send people in a bad way. So, uh, the other thing would be secure a part-time job so you have some funding and don't rely on anybody else and try to get some sponsors. But generally speaking, you got to have, I think, a part-time work because you have to develop your brain and your body balance, and that be, then you, so you're a good human being beyond your job. Mm. And uh, here, I think this next one could be a good question to you know wrap up the the session and. I feel like the javelin doesn't always get as much love as it deserves, um, especially in high school. We have a lot of states that still don't compete in the javelin. Like, what what can we do as as a, as a coaching community, as athletes, as people who you know enjoy this sport that clearly you've fallen in love with? Mm-hmm. What can we do to to help promote the javelin and expand it into the these states and areas that you know don't have that opportunity? That's a good question. I don't have a great answer, but the main thing is, if you have interest, you try to create comp. I, I think the biggest thing, first step is we have to have some, uh, uh, give summer competitions. So if you have a facility available and you're a reasonable person and you have an official that you can pay the 50 or hundred dollars to and get sanctioning, the key is to have some summertime competitions that you can start to have a meeting point for people to come. In 2011, I created a few throwing events in Chicago called the Chicago Land Throw Series, thinking that we needed to have some more positively supportive throwing events. We used to have you know, summer track and field events, but the officials would come in complaining. You know, they were, I hate to rip on them, but, you know, old guys that were upset with the kids warming up at the wrong time and, you know, we played music and got everybody excited. And it turns out that these events end up, everybody ends up throwing a personal best. And so, for example, if you're a shot putter and you're a sophomore in high school and your season ends and you've thrown 47 feet, six inches, but then you compete that summer and you throw 50 foot two. Well, as you come to junior year, you're not a 47 footer, you're a 50 footer. And to me, that's huge. You know, and there's nothing like seeing a kid PR, you know, and we're a coaches. Come on. I don't care what level you're at, but when somebody throws a PR, you know, does a little fist bump, it's the greatest thing in the world. So um, I think that we start with creating some javelin events around and then definitely, I mean, that's going to be the key. So if you're asking me about states bringing in the javelin, that's a tougher one. It's beyond my uh, ability to grasp and to try to explain how, but I think we can do it safely. And there are more states picking it up. Florida's got it going. There's ways to do it. You know, I, I would advise that the, the fin flyer be used for younger athletes. It's a good teaching mechanism for uh, someone that's like 11 to 13 years old. It teaches you how to fly a javelin. There's a lot of benefits there. And, um, and, and just to safety, a couple of years back, I come from a state where a young man lost his life during a hammer competition at Wheaton College. He was hit in the face. And one of my parents of an athlete that I coached for three years, who was a superintendent of schools, who was a sweet, sweet guy named James Bunting out of Watsika, Illinois, he saw it happen in front of his face. And he called me that night sobbing, uh, very distraught, and asked that safety be paramount. So as a throws coach, I'm quite worried about safety and they don't see enough other people take it as a priority like I do. So I try to avoid having too many officials out in the field when there's a shot or disc or a javelin competition. And here at my high school at Hoover, my head coach is like the greatest guy named Devin Hind. He flags off the sector. So we at least avoid, and we actually will put a parent or somebody or an athlete and say, your job today is don't let anybody cross the field. Mm. So things like that. So to me, it's competition, safety, don't let anybody get hurt. And then coaching-wise, find it on the internet. There's so many good people out there. Instagram, is. there's a lot of good things. Do the best you can. And as you move up, get to a bigger competition. Very cool. Well, uh, I really appreciate you sharing your time. And, and you know, thanks. Um, it's been eye-opening to me in, in several ways. And I, I appreciate getting to meet you and and. You know, thank you very much and, and wish sure. your, your crew the health and, and, and stay uh, uh, stay sane. And at least you guys get to do the garage yeah. workouts. And, um, you know, um, 
Yeah. We're training more for, you know, we're not training for hyper performance. We're training to maintain mental sanity. Now it's, <laughs> yeah. you know, this has been a trying time internationally. And, uh, I think that it's starting to get to a point where we see a, a season coming and, and we're getting a little excited, but we got to be still be careful and everything like that. Yeah. And, um, last thing I guess is, uh, you know, big thank you to you, Tom, and, and big thank you to MF and, and the national coast throws coach association. They've been doing a great job helping us get the word out on this. Oh yeah. I know MF is doing a 15% off all Nike throwing shoes for anybody that is watching this today. Oh. Um, you guys, he's got a code that I think he can put up, Rob, we're going to put that in the chat. Uh, I think it's VTC one five, I believe. So, um, you know, that's – thank you. They're, they're, they're always trying to support throwers, and we really appreciate that. We wish, appreciate the work. Wait, we Rob. Do, we do Rob, I'm going to bust Rob's <laughs> bubble right now. Did you say, did you, say you were going to give me 100 bucks if I answered the question correctly? The, the, if you answered the, the trivia question. Okay. So I'll, I don't need the 100 bucks. You <laughs> have to give that money to somebody who's going to call in and buy a javelin. So you got to don't okay. you got to give up a hundred dollar right. discount. Okay. Whoever so calls you to buy a javelin, you better give that right now. We'll do that. Yes, <laughs> that's how it should work, buddy. Yes. Okay. <laughs> um, that works. That works. All right. Awesome, well, Brandon. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank I really you very much. Fun. Thanks, Tom. Appreciate it very much. Take care, everybody. Thanks for listening. Really appreciate it. Bye. Oh.